That's a great, a great song of praise. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Well, you know, um, Brother and I were talking just before service began about testimonies in church, and I guess that's what I love about going to church. Uh, you never know what to expect. I have a preacher friend, well, he's with the Lord now, but he used to preach for him down in Georgia, Gainesville, Georgia. You ever heard of Wilbur, uh, T Willard Thomas in Georgia? You probably heard the poem uh, about the, the sand, one walking in the sand, footprints in the sand or something like that. He wrote that poem. But what a preacher. That's how he preached. When he preached, he gave poems. But he's got a sign in the baptistry right behind him that says, Welcome, Holy Ghost. <laughs> I asked him one time, I said, Brother Willard, what time does service start? He said, we start when folks get here. I said, well, what time do you end? He said, we end when we're done. <laughs> I said, wow, Lord does lead that thing, because I never got out of there before 1.15 p.m. Sunday morning. But it was a blessing always, just a rich time. But I love, I love that, that kind of a feel of a church, and, and your church has that spirit. Uh, the other night we had a wonderful time, and the watch night, and uh, most of you were a part of that. What a blessing, I thank you for allowing me to join you eating those tamales. I went home and bragged about it to the family. Too bad they didn't come. Uh, they missed out. Those were some good tamales, sure enough. Now, my, my daughter-in-law is Hispanic, and her mother makes tamales at certain times uh, during the year, but she will not let my daughter-in-law, her name is Lisa, will not let her come in the kitchen. She says she has a weak eye. Anybody know a, heard of weak eye before? Okay. I don't know, maybe it's her mother's own superstition, but she said, don't come in here. <laughs> she tells her in Spanish, don't come in here while I'm making tamales, you have a weak guy. I guess that'll mess up the recipe. I don't know, but that's some severe superstition problems right there, I think. But anyhow, those were good the other night, excellent. I had more than one, praise the Lord. I want you to look in your Bibles in John chapter 8. I'm uh, thankful I was able to show you the video, and we got a little bit of... Uh, Dad's, dad's preaching two or three times a month still. It wears him out, preacher. He'll preach on Sunday or he'll preach on Wednesday. And Miss Faye says he's down for two or three days. It takes him two or three days to get ready to preach. And then he's wore out for two or three days. And, uh, but he loves to preach still. And uh, good grief. I couldn't, uh, can you imagine us over 70 years of preaching ministry? How many outlines and sermons? And he's read the Bible over 200 times. And uh, it just flows. Uh, I remember as a young preacher, I was uh, starting a church in southern Michigan back in 82. And the church had started to get on its feet, and they were paying my rent, but they weren't giving me a salary. So you know, I had to find means of income. But anyhow, I said, Dad, I, I wanna, I'm thinking about building a house. He said, prepare thy fields without, and then build thy house. That's all he told me. Quoted from the book of Proverbs. And uh, that made a lot of sense. You know, in other words, get your fields planted. Make sure they're producing before you build a house, amen? You might be on a field that won't produce. So anyhow, um, I, I have been privileged, privileged to have a, a dad all these years. I know that not everybody, um, uh, not everybody's dad lives to be 92. And uh, I, I'm so blessed. I talk to him at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. But the situation is, uh, when I do get to talking, if there's a lull, he said, did I tell you the one about the farmer? And of course he's told me. A hundred times he's told me that joke, but I listen to him and I laugh just as much. So, amen. I love him to pieces. And I get to see him, oh, probably six or eight times a year and uh, appreciate his influence, not only on myself, but on so many around the world. I want to talk to you this, more, this evening about John chapter 8, where out of one verse there, in verse number 36, it's a tremendous thought. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those verses that doesn't just apply to salvation. It applies across the board. Look what it says in verse 36. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. What does it mean to be free indeed? Amen. Father, bless thy word uh, tonight to these who have set aside this time. I pray, Father, that it would be a helpful thing. Not only from the singing, we've already been blessed and helped. It was a blessing also to see these little ones being trained to sing. And hopefully that in their heart, a seed will be planted. That they can uh, 
work on and cultivate and blossom into something that will amount to great things for Thee. And we also thank You, Lord, for the church and its testimony here in this region. God bless us for Jesus' sake. Uh, feed us from Thy Word. It's in Thy name we pray. Amen. A you know, man has forever longed to be free from sin. Uh, that's probably our greatest need is freedom from sin. Even after we get saved, we've been freed. Technically, we're free. Theologically, we have been freed from sin. But sometimes we engage ourselves back into sin. Romans tells us, God forbid. <laughs> if you've been set free, then don't go back. But uh, I can tell you, uh, most of us fall. We fail. And uh, sin sneaks up. You know, the devil's been at this thing for thousands of years. Don't ever think you're a big shot and you can outsmart the devil. You can't. And he's outsmarted bigger and smarter and folks have been saved a lot longer and people who have accomplished greater things. And uh, so don't ever challenge him. I've always asked God, Lord, don't ever turn the devil loose on me like you did Job. I don't want that. I don't want any part of that. Amen. <laughs> I don't want God to say, consider my servant Johnny. <laughs> no, Lord, I don't want that. Uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think I'm a big shot enough for the devil to fool with me. I think that he sets his demons of hell on us. I could be all wrong on that, but that's just my thinking. You know, I'm not a big leaguer. Uh, maybe, maybe the devil does uh, attack every single one of us, but I tend to think it's more of the demons and those demons, by the way, are demons that are hovering around. They're always around. I mean, the more that uh, the culture invites them, the more they come. Uh, you know, America is a Christian nation. It was founded on the Word of God. There's no question about that. Uh, you know, did we get those constitutions? Was that here the other night? Somebody gave out constitutions and read that little thing there. To, I think it was John Adams say that, that there has to be uh, uh, some religion, there has to be a, a culture of religion, Christianity, because this kind of government doesn't work unless there's a Christian culture going on. And that's, uh, that's what's going on. We're, Christian culture is being kicked out. It's being thwarted. It's being choked. And it's being attacked. And they're attacking us every way they can. And at the same time, they're pushing Christianity out. They're inviting Satan in. They don't know it. If you, say, if you told them, you're inviting Satan into our culture, they would not believe you, but that's exactly what they're doing. Between Hollywood and music and uh, everything that's going on uh, in, in America that's, that is against God, it's a culture of, of Satan. And uh, what happens when Christians open the door to these things that are in the world, this culture, and you pump that filth into your head and into your heart and into your living room or into your car, you are opening the door and saying, okay, demon, come on in. Don't, don't hurt me much, but come on in. Uh, what a foolish thing for us to do, but that's what we do. If we're not careful, that's what we do. Uh, we have to, you dads especially, you have to build a hedge. You have to be strong and uh, try to keep it out. And, you know, the kids will maybe complain because, well, all the other kids are doing it. <laughs> and you know what your mother said, same thing my mother said. If all the kids jumped off the edge of the building, would you do it? I probably would if I was crazy. I'd take an umbrella and jump, you know. But, but um, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, but sometimes we see there are some believers. They claim to be saved, and maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but they're up and down. They got the spirituality of a yo-yo, up and down, up and down. They can't get with it. I had a young friend of mine who could not stay right with God. He'd get right with God, weep and wail at the altar and shout the victory. He's a teenage boy. He's 18 years old, out of high school. And, and then two weeks later, he's right back down in the gutter again. And uh, I said, Lord, why don't you, the next time Rodney gets right with God, Lord, why don't you just call him home? <laughs> and then the Lord said, why don't I do that to you too? <laughs> well, it's your call. It's not my call. Man longs to be free from sin. They don't even know it. That world out there does not know that they want to be free from sin, but that's their problem. They want to be free from sin. If you tonight are saved, it's because you wanted freedom from sin. Uh, most, though, want it to be under their own terms. They want to set their own terms for salvation. That's where religion comes from. 
uh, good grief, all the denominations. You math teachers know what a denominator is. That's what determines the value of the numerator. Uh, it's the denominator. And so that denominator uh, kind of associates with uh, the word denomination. And there's all different denominations. Um, I hate to even think that a Baptist is a denomination. I call myself a Bible believer. Uh, but they're out there. Where, where? How did they get so many different denominations? I mean, there's the Catholics, Methodists, and Presbyterians, and Lutherans, and all this bunch. I mean, you go down the line, and now we've got all kinds of crazy stuff going on. The Vine Church, and, and all this stuff. It's all kinds of stuff. You know what it is? The denominator is salvation. And they are setting their own value on it. When you get baptized. You've got to get it works for it. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to give this. You've got to be that. And if you're not even an elect, you can't be a part of it. Come on. I just want to be a Bible believer. When I'm so winning, I tell somebody, I don't care where they came from, what kind of background they have. I said, look, let's take all your Catholicism or Presbyterianism or whatever you are. Let's take all of that. And I'll take all my Baptist doctrine. Let's just throw it out the window. And let's just see what God says. After all, he's the author of salvation. Isn't that right? And I said, let's just see what God says in his word. Forget about what we've been taught. Let's just look at this honestly with an open mind and, and without any subject. Uh, just, just take a look at it. And sometimes you can help people, sometimes you can't. You know, Cain was guilty in his heart for his unwillingness to follow God's design for worship. You know the story in Genesis chapter 3, chapter 4. Cain had it all figured out. Uh, in fact, he sought to remove the object that he felt was producing his guilt. What was producing his guilt? It was his brother, Abel. You've got to get rid of him. That way I can worship any way I want to, because as long as Abel's around, he's doing it the way God wants it. I want to do it my way. Now look, that, that might be a simplistic explanation, but that fits most individuals in this world that are religious. They're looking for freedom, but it has to come on God's terms. Jews. Because of their traditions, they had a self-prescribed form of religion, but it was devoid of God. It was devoid of truth relative to grace and mercy. They understood nothing about grace and mercy. All they could do was, was throw the book at you, and they could all quote the letter of the law. They had no, no grasp of the spirit of the law. When Jesus would perform miracles, they tried to... Uh, get after him and badger him over that. And he, boy, he called, I love it. He called, you know, remember when, um, I think it was the president got in trouble for calling somebody uh, animals? Some uh, the gangsters, some, they're, they're animals. Well, Jesus called this crowd vipers and foxes. And <laughs> pretty bad, pretty bad stuff. But because that's what their behavior was like. The Jews, the Jews were void of truth. When John and Jesus came into their presence preaching righteousness, repentance, it infuriated these Jews because it magnified their own spiritual deficiency. You know, when, when, you're, when you're a born-again child of God, maybe down there at the job, maybe it's when your family gets together and there's lost ones there, or maybe it's just in any other arena, if you will, of wherever you are, and somehow you, the, uh, the, the, the light shines upon you and you get to raise the torch of the gospel. Or maybe it's just your testimony. Believe it or not, folks, if you're, a, if you're a child of God, there's something about you. If you're spirit-filled, there may not be a glow, but there's something about a child of God. And people either will hate you or they'll wonder what in the world do they have that I don't have? They see you go through trials. They know that you make less money. They yet know that you go to church every time the door is open. They know you tithe your income. And yet they, they, they think, man, they should be broke. They should be poverty stricken, but they're, they're happy. And their kids are obedient. And they're, 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 they're happy. They got purpose in their life. Why can't I have that? I got all this money and I got this home. And I got this car. Why can't I have that? Jealousy. 
uh, old Dr. J. Frank North, I know you heard of him, preacher. Oh, f f we, some call him the father of fundamentalism. Man, he was a rip-roaring Baptist down in Texas years ago. And uh, he said this, people are going to hate you for one of three reasons. If you have more, know more, or do more. Think about it. That applies. People are going to hate you. If you have Jesus, there's some people going to hate you because you're so happy in the Lord. It doesn't seem right, does it? Because really, you want them to have Jesus as much as you want Jesus. And really, it's, it's everybody's option to just, just have him. But these Jews, when Jesus and John came up preaching repentance, they got so mad. And so what they did was they removed the object of their guilt. They chopped off the head of John the Baptist. They put Jesus Christ on Calvary's tree. They thought, well, this will allow them to go on with their lifestyle and live without guilt. Doesn't work, though. We know that doesn't work. During the 60s, I guess I can call that my generation. I was a high schooler then. I graduated in 71, but I was coming up in the 60s watching the hippie movement and all that. But that generation experimented with debauchery. And they wanted debauchery, but they wanted no consequences. They called it freedom. <laughs> Free love. Uh, expressing himself, themselves. And actually, it was not freedom. It was slavery to sin. It was an expression of man's depraved nature. It's all it amounted to. Any of you folks with white hair, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It went on all across this country, from California to Woodstock. They were, they were nuts. Smoking dope, living outside of marriage, hippie communes, they all come together, had a great big a group of dozens of people, some of them numbered almost 200, that lived in a wood somewhere and had a bunch of kids and nobody was married and, well, they wind up with a bunch of youngins that the government had to raise. They overdosed, they contracted diseases and, and uh, did not finance their own way. The outcome of this experiment, I believe, was contributed to LBJ's great society a welfare system that we are strapped with now to doomsday. And uh, we've got a public school system that, that uh, can hardly afford enough personnel to manage the unruly students that are on hand. It's a terrible thing. They need the Lord. But they wanted freedom. Did they get freedom? No, they didn't get freedom. They, they got themselves enslaved. Uh, one thing that our culture should have learned and I think they're still in denial. They should have learned that there is a consequence for sin. The wages of sin is death. So there is a consequence for sin. Boy, I'll tell you, it's in a blessing when you, when you discipline your child, and after they get done sniffling, after you've prayed with them and hugged them, and I hope that's what you do. Don't just beat them and throw them in the corner. Don't ever do that. You wouldn't want God to do you like that. Uh, I, 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 my, my rule in my head for my life, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that includes your kids, amen, and love them. And so anyhow, when you get done, and, and when they respond with a humble heart, and you can see, you can sense that, that broken spirit, that penitence in their soul. That's a blessing. And if you can see that strong will, you know what? You're knowing that tomorrow you're going to have to do this all over again. <laughs> Uh, because they haven't learned that there's a consequence for their wrongdoing. Uh, that's rough. Uh, I, I, I raised my little boy. He was, uh, he's not a little boy anymore, but I raised him, and I tell everybody, he thought it was easier to get forgiveness than it was to get permission. That was his philosophy. <laughs> and we had to beat that out of him. It was tough. I always say this, too. Aren't you glad that the word spank is not in the King James Bible? Amen, kiddos? It's not spank, spanking. The word spank is not in the Bible. It does say beat them, though, amen, <laughs> beat them with a rod. The blueness of the wound, drive of the way, reproach. But anyhow, Spank's a little bit too modernistic. Here, here, here's something I found. Uh, this, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. A biochemist announced that within a certain number of years, neurologists would cope with the inherent, inerrant uh, evils of mankind on a scientific, physiological basis. Now, don't get lost in the verbiage here. Uh, they're thinking that the biochemists would discover there's some kind of a physiological imbalance in, in man. So that's why he does wrong. He said, soon we will not say a man is vicious or criminal or guilty of immoral acts. Instead, we will know that he has 
too much, forgive me, pyruvic acid in his thalamic cells, or that there's no carboxylic, carboxylase in his thalamus, we, we will be able to tell whether or not he grew enough association neurons to descend from his cortex so that he has enough acetyl, acetyl, oh boy, acetylcholine in his midbrain or mesenphalon. Uh, if you're a medical, you know I'm mispronouncing these words, but they try to medically diagnose sin. Can you imagine? That's the world we live in. They're crazy. They're absolutely crazy. And they, they can look in a, a mirror and deny it's even them. I, um, I, I feel that America has just gotten to that place. In Romans chapter 2, we're going to look there and read a few verses. And I'm, I'm shooting for seven preachers, that, if that's okay. Romans chapter number 2. <clears throat> It says this, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? You know, that's a great verse that uh, America needs to listen to right there. There's the great songwriter that gave us one of our national hymns, God shed his grace on thee. Uh, that's America. God has been good to this nation. And right there, there Paul, the writer, because he knew that Israel, God had been good to Israel, snatched them out, chose them as a people unto himself. And God has blessed this country as well. Yet they despise the riches of his goodness and the forbearance of his long suffering. There's a lot of meat right there in those few verses. That word forbearance, that means that God is holding back your deserved punishment. He's forbearing. Uh, like you are when you're in Walmart and someone's in there trying to teach their kids something. And they're screaming bloody murder. And oh, you want to go over there and grab them by the ear, don't you? Maybe you're not like me, but that's what I want to do. Uh, but we have to forbear. That's what that means. And God is forbearing and long-suffering. And yet, it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Verse 5, After thy hardness and impenitent heart Treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That's a tremendous verse number five, that we can treasure up wrath against the day of wrath. With rebellion, with sin, we're just packing it away. It's like we're making investments, and we're going to reap that investment one day. That's what God's saying. That judgment is, is coming, and that's America. Verse 6, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, they're, they're, they're going to reap eternal life. Verse 8, but unto them that are contentious, that is, they fight and argue, rebel, they resist God. They do not obey the truth in verse 8, but obey unrighteousness. What are they going to reap? They're going to reap indignation and wrath, tribulation anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentiles. So it doesn't apply just to Jews or just Americans. It applies to everybody. Verse 10, but glory, honor, peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile for there's no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law. As many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of, their, of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another." 
There's a lot of theology down in those verses. It would take almost a semester to unfold it all. But basically this, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. And assuming that this will free him. Uh, there is no God. I don't believe in God. So therefore, I am free to live any way I want to. <laughs> what a foolish assumption. They claim they're enlightened, but actually they're plunged into a further darkness by rejection, rejecting the light that they have. You know, it's amazing. We can step out the door on a beautiful day, and whether it's beautiful or not, this truth is still the same. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the earth showeth his, showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night uttereth knowledge, showeth knowledge. And it says there is no speech nor language where his voice is not heard. God has made it plain to every person on this earth. I don't care if you are in California or if you are in the middle of a de desert in Iraq. The heavens declare the glory of God. I've heard of people who just started seeking God because they, they figured in their heart there has to be something bigger out there going on. I've heard about that. You know, I do, I do believe this sincerely too, that if people are searching, they'll find. The Lord says, search me and ye shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. What well, he said. Amen. I've heard of it happening. It's a wonderful thing. You know, you may have a neighbor that's searching. You may have a loved one. You may have a relative that's searching. And it's hard for us to see that. But we have to be a witness. The Bible says, we're to let our light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God which is in heaven. So even if you're going to get criticized, even if you're going to be ostracized, even if the relatives kind of snicker behind your back, even if they make fun, even if they belittle your kids or do not include your kids, you still got to love them. You still got to pray for them. I uh, preached a funeral years ago, and it was amazing uh, what happened in this instance. A lady in my church, uh, her and her husband had lived in a neighborhood. And, you know, sometimes you're just attached to people. And uh, somehow, even though they moved to a different state, and then they moved back again to the area, they didn't get in the same neighborhood. But they stayed in contact with these neighbors. of our, They weren't Christians. They were just good neighbors. Uh, I've got neighbors like that. I appreciate it. They watch my house. I've got an old hippie lives behind me, Caddy Corner. And uh, he calls me long distance, wherever I'm at. He calls me, of course, kids, you don't even know what long distance calling is anymore, do you? <laughs> so, duh. so he calls me, though, no matter where I'm at, what time it is. He calls me, hey, John, there's somebody messing around your house. And I say, okay, go get him, Willie. Call the cops. Do something. And, uh, and I have had him to church before. But, you know, this family in my church, they had some neighbors, and they loved him. And they got word that the lady had um, severe diabetes, and she was going to have both legs amputated. Um, it was going to put her in a wheelchair. And so they came to me. They said, Pastor, would you and Tina go and visit this lady in the hospital? My wife is Tina. And as some of you know, my wife's in a wheelchair. I, one day, you're going to meet her. Uh, I'm hoping um, soon before the Lord comes. But if not, we'll meet her in heaven. You'll meet her in heaven. But my wife's in a wheelchair. We were in an accident way back when we first got married. So she'd been in a wheelchair for almost 46 years. And uh, uh, she's getting more and more feeble now. She's getting older, but she's still a lot of fun. It just, just gets harder for her. But my, these people in my church, they said, Pastor, we think Tina could maybe relate to this lady and, and kind of help her, prepare her for, for what's ahead because she'd been in a wheelchair a long time. And, and I just want our friend, her name was Mary. She said, I just want Mary to realize that life is not over. And so we went, we talked to Mary. And you know, sometimes uh, the devil will leave you alone so you can talk. But usually at a hospital, nurses coming and going, doctors, you know, you have to get out of the way. And so we did connect that day and we had prayer with her. She was alone, and uh, Tina was able to talk to her, hold her hand, and pray for her. And uh, I, I, I really wish you could know my wife. Um, that girl, she spends a lot of time with the Lord. And she's flat on her back and spends a lot of time with the Lord. She has to, with a husband like me. She has to, she has to pray. But, but anyhow, she took that lady's hands, and I could tell that lady was touched. And so I got her address. I found out she got out of the hospital, so I went by the house, 
and her husband was there, and her brother was there. And I went in, I was so glad. I was able to open the gospel to her and, and show Mary how to be saved. I said, would you like to trust Jesus as your savior? And I said, your friend Dottie and her husband John have been praying for you, and uh, don't do this for them, do this for Mary. You need to be saved. And she, te tears in her eyes. I mean, it's one of those wonderful times when you, I didn't win them, the Lord brought them, but those people prayed and their testimony was real. Uh, and by the way, don't ever get discouraged. If you pray for somebody and you live before them and yet somebody else leads them to the Lord, don't get jealous over that. Just rejoice! Amen. They would never have won them. They would have never got to first base if you had been a phony Christian in front of them for as long as you've known them. And I guarantee you, if you'd have been a phony and they knew it, they would want nothing to do with Christianity. So you know, God spreads the blessings around a lot. So I knew that all I was doing that day was picking ripe fruit from the tree. And Mary bowed her head and asked Christ to save her. When we looked up, her husband was sobbing. He had red eyes. He wasn't sobbing, but he had tear-filled eyes. I said, his name was John. I said, no, his name was Byron. I said, Byron, you heard the gospel. You sat right here. Do you know all you're a sinner? He said, I sure do. I said, wouldn't you like to trust Jesus? And Ask him to save you right now. And I told to him about repentance. He bowed his head. He asked Christ to save him. And there was her brother, Sam. His name was Sam. I said, what about you, Sam? He's not. He said, all three of those adults. Uh, they were not kids. They were in their 60s, probably maybe 70s. I don't know. They were white-haired. But all three. Now, that to me is a rare thing. God did that day. I was so happy. But I got to the, shortly after that, within just a month or two, she did pass away. And her husband had called, called, uh, talked to the daughters, and the daughters knew about me. So they called me and said, would you do mom's funeral? I said, absolutely. I would, I would love to do a funeral service. So I preached at a funeral home probably from this side of the altar. It was full of people, probably 120 to 130 people in that room. And I didn't know if any of them were saved. So I just gave them the gospel. I gave them that same experience I just had. I said, you know what I told Mary the other day? I talked to her in her home. I told her she needed to get saved. She was, going, she was lost without Christ, going to a devil's hell. I told them that right, right from that pulpit. And I don't know if I stirred them up, but uh, they heard the gospel that day. I got done, let the families come by and, you know, their, their last respects. And it was kind of tight in there, so I stepped out in the, in the foyer of the building. Here was the door going outside, and there was like a foyer. And this couple came in with two or three teenage kids. They came in, they said, um, is that the funeral for, for, for Mary? And um, I forget their last name. Her name was Mary. I said, yeah, that's the funeral. And the man was just brokenhearted. He said, oh, we, we tried. We were trying to come over the mountains, up in the Cascade Mountains. It was the roads were closed. We had a terrible time. Had to go all the way around. And, and he said, uh, we should have left sooner. But he said, I feel so bad. He said, we're born again Christians. We lived over there in Wenatchee, uh, Washington. And we don't get to see Aunt Mary that much. But we don't know if she was ever saved. I said, Did you, have you been praying? He said, oh, we've been praying for her for years. I said, let me tell you something. I told him the story. And that family just wept. Even the kids were weeping because they prayed for that Aunt Mary to get saved. I'll tell you what, uh, that's a blessing. That's a rich blessing. Oh, I wish the world could just see and know what God has for them. They want freedom. They do want freedom. Even out here in California, all those homeless folk up the road there, they want freedom, but they want it on their own terms. We've got to let them know it's got to be on God's terms. There's only three things. I call it the ABCs of salvation. Admit, admit you're a sinner. Believe that Christ paid the debt for you on Calvary and confess him. Admit, believe, and confess. Now, in that admittance, now that's where repentance comes in. You know, uh, my dad's an old preacher. He's been preaching a long time, had thousands of people saved. And here's one of his statements. There's no conversion without conviction. A person has to know that they're lost. Right. What do you repent of if you don't know you're lost? When you're dealing with people, they have to have that understanding that there's such a thing as repentance. And when they admit that they're a sinner, a sinner, not a sinner, uh, a sinner, <laughs> And they admit they're a sinner. That's when you bring that in. Yes, we're sinners. 
And we cannot go on in sin. We cannot have this attitude that it's okay if I keep sinning. I just want to go to heaven too. Well, then that's having, that's having salvation on your terms. It doesn't work that way. It's got to be on God's terms. We've got to turn our back on sin. Oh, so you're saying you have to be sinlessly perfect. No, I'm not. But your whole attitude has to change about sin. It surely does. I should have had amen right there. <laughs> your, your attitude has to change about sin. You're no longer going to excuse it. You're no longer going to laugh at it. You're not going to be like a fool and make a mock at sin. That's what fools do. You know, I've heard so many testimonies of people who, when they were lost, they, they didn't know what sin was. They just carried out. They got drunk. They get, did whatever they wanted to do. They had no thought about it. And then they got hit with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful day. Admit you're a sinner. Believe that Christ paid the debt on Calvary and that he rose from the dead for your justification. And thirdly, confess. Confess him as your own Lord and Savior. And we, as a Christian, we should be experiencing freedom every single day of our lives. Freedom. Uh, you might want to refer to it as victory. Uh, but we should have victory. Did you know that if you're born again, you have all the equipment you need to be a victor victorious Christian? You have it. You've got the sword. You've got the shield. You've got the word. You've got everything. You've got your feet shod. You've got, you got everything that you need to have victory. It, it, I, you may think I'm a little bit extreme, but it is possible for a born-again Christian to live a life free from sin. I believe it with all my heart. I've never seen anybody do it. But it's possible. How many believe it? Well, I could have victory at least for the rest of this evening. I could have victory. I, could, I probably could go the rest of this evening without sinning. Anybody agree with that? I think so. Well, if you can do it the rest of this evening, why not tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day? We can strive for freedom. That's one thing we can do in 2020, huh? Try to get that victory. Try to get that freedom. And it's ours. Pump this head full of the right stuff coming in through the ears, through the eyes, even through the mouth. <laughs> Everything that we allow into our vessel. Uh, if it's sanctified, if it honors God, then it's not going to pollute you. I'm talking about spiritual pollution. We live in such a thing, you know, there's, we talk about the power of sin and the penalty of sin. And thank God one day we'll be free from the presence of sin, but... In this world, there's such a thing as the pollution of sin. Now, let me illustrate it quickly for you, and, and I'll be done. But the pollution of sin is this. Suppose, suppose you're uh, lost in a desert, car breaks down, you're way out in the middle of nowhere, no gas, tires are flat, or engines broke down, and you've got to walk. And you've got to walk miles and miles and miles, and it's hot, and the sun is baking, and you get to the place where you're desperately thirsty, and you're so thirsty that the first sign of water, you don't care, you're going to drink it. You say, oh, I'll never do that. You, you've not been that thirsty then. Uh, there may be an uh, opportunity that there's water, and you just have to moisten your hand and, and suck some liquid off your hand. There's no telling what you're getting into. You're drinking from the ground. But that's what a sinner does. He gets so desperate to satisfy his flesh and that hungering in his soul for whatever this world can dish out to him, he'll go right down into the hog pen and he'll eat the, with the swine. That's the pollution of sin. It'll take you places where you never dreamed you possibly could ever go and participate. That's what sin will do. So we have to cleanse that, cleanse that soul of ours. Thank the Lord. We can take a bath every day. Isn't it wonderful? Uh, the washing of the water of the Word. Spend some time with the Lord, fellowship with Him. And step by step, He could be right there with us. Uh, the wonderful thing about the Lord is He forgives. Uh, I heard one preacher explain it like this. John chapter 1, verse 9. Um, uh, I better read it to you. It's escaping me. I just know the reference tonight. I, I probably spent it said it a hundred times and somebody could spout it for me if you'd help me. <laughs> John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, what? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a wonderful verse in the Bible. But we don't have to live by that every moment. 
Lord, I, I yelled at my wife again. I'm confessing, so forgive me. <laughs> you know, if you do that 15 times a day, uh, there's a problem there. You need to deal with it. You need to go a little bit deeper and find out what's going on. And uh, kind of like the thing where the ox is in the ditch. There's a fellow that excused himself from going to church. Well, my ox was in the ditch this week. The old preacher down in North Carolina, we used to know old Carl Lackey, he said, if that's your problem week after week, you either get rid of that ox or fill up the ditch. Amen. <laughs> Do something about it. But 1 John 1, 9 is a wonderful verse that shows us that God will forgive us. But it's, it's kind of like a bumper on a car. Uh, we had the sister testifying about her driving the other day. I'll never forget that. It was a good one. <laughs> uh, God didn't give us bumpers. Uh, that's John 1, 9. Is, it should not be a bumper. Just because we have bumpers on our car doesn't mean we can go around bumping people, amen? I mean, it's nice to have them, and I wish we could sometimes. <laughs> Just bump, 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 push them right out of the way. But um, that's, what, that's not what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. Get that forgiveness. Get that cleansing. Verse 7 says, if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's where the freedom is. That's what makes it real. Walking with him. Getting filled up with this book. Filled up with this spirit. Emptying of yourself. You'll find freedom. And that's something we need to look for in, in 2020. That's something we can look for the rest of our life. As long as we're alive. God, God has a purpose for everyone in this room. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how able you are. God has a purpose. You know, my poor old dad, we've, you've, some of you have met him. He's been here preached at, at West Coast. Um, we were just talking about a preacher that I've been five years will be April. Five, five or six. I, mean, I don't know. Fourteen, yeah, six years this coming April. Last time dad was here. But his life is reduced to getting out of bed and then with a walker hobbling out into the, through the living room, into the kitchen, very slowly. Miss Faye walks him and walks him until he get, he's got a solarium, a beautiful thing that lets the sun shine right in him. He loves heat. And so he sits in a reclining chair and then that chair lowers him down and rakes him back and he spends all day long in that chair reading 10 chapters in his Bible and praying for over 7,000 people. He does this every single day of his life. That's his life. That's his purpose. He does it under the Lord. He said, I can't miss. He told me one time, he said, oh, I was up till midnight trying to get through my prayer list. He said, I had so many interruptions. <laughs> I bless his heart. He won't quit. You just keep on. But what if that was all God had for you? That's what God has for him. What, what, what a deal. What if that's all that God had for you? Well, all we can do is keep filled with this. Fill up. Get filled up. And that fullness is where the freedom comes. Father, we do love you tonight. Oh, there's so much to look forward to this month, next month, and the following months, this whole year, the next year, the next five years, ten years, there's young people in here that uh, if things don't change, if your return is not in the next ten or twenty years, these young people that grow up going to have families, and they'll need to have some purpose. They need to have a plan. God help each and every one of us to set some standards in our own life. Help these young fathers to put up those walls that will protect their children from this wicked culture. Lord, help us to bask in the freedom that's ours and the fullness that's ours through Jesus Christ. I pray for that one that could be here without Christ. Lord, they long for freedom and we know it. Please help them to come to Jesus. We ask it in thy precious name and for thy sake. Amen. Amen, preacher.